Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. We'd like to tell you tonight about a man named Davy Crockett, part history and part legend. He and men like him gave their lives to build this nation where once the winds were lonely and the earth silent. Some gave it a spirit. Once in a while, they themselves became legends. The Cavalcade players bring you the story of one of them, Davy Crockett, in a radio play written by Peter Lyon and starring John McIntyre. Our orchestra and the original musical score are under the direction of Don Voorhees. DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents John McIntyre as Davy Crockett on the Cavalcade of America. <laughs> Tucked away in a pleasant corner of space, a way where time has no meaning, there's a part of the promised land reserved for Americans, where all comers are allowed to wander anywhere they want. Anywhere, that is, except on one cloud. On just this one cloud, there's a sign which says, Reserved, and another, Keep off this cloud, and still another saying, Only legends allowed here. That's the cloud where John Henry lived, and Paul Bunyan and Huckleberry Finn and Pecos Bill and Daniel Boone. Just recently, Davy Crockett climbed aboard that cloud. He had a hard job, though. Why shouldn't I be allowed on this cloud? I'm as much a legend as most of the folks around here. More than some. <laughs> Listen, Ed. I'm as good a legend as you are, John Henry. What? You put yourself up against John Henry, the natural man? Boy... You ever been sawed up for firewood? I has. I'm John Henry, the natural man. And when I laugh, the ocean stops slapping on the shore. And the winds all say to the little waves, hush your mouth, waves, because John Henry is laughing his big laugh all the way across the world. <laughs> well, I'm as much a legend as Daniel Boone. What? Or you, Johnny Appleseed. Hey, Pop! What is it, Huckleberry? If you want to stay, you got to prove you're a legend, just like the rest of us all done. So start in talking. Proof is what we want. That's right. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. That all. All right, everybody. Now just listen for yourself. When my ears for a heel tapper before I get through, you don't say Davy Crockett is a sure enough all wool legend. So here goes, as the boy said when he run by himself. I'll haul off and tell you my whole life, right from when I was just a youngster. Had a pretty tough upbringing, but I reckon hunting come natural to me. My pappy was a stern man, but he was kind-hearted. He taught me to find my way around, all right. I was down in Tennessee, what's now Jefferson County. When I was full grown, I started courting. Polly. Polly Finley. That was her name. If all the hills about there were pure gold and all belonged to me, I'd give them if I could just talk to her as I want. Mr. Crockett, ain't you feeling well? You speak so little this evening. Well, Miss Polly, trouble is whenever I think of anything to say to you, my heart begins to flutter like a duck in a puddle. Oh, oh, honest? Why... Why, that's funny, Mr. Crockett. Yeah, and then when I outdo my heart and speak, it gets right smack up in my throat and chokes me like a cold potato. You seem to be talking clear like now. Well, Polly, Miss Polly, my ma was telling me that what I should say is that you're the darling object of my soul and body and that I must have you or else I shall pine down to nothing and just die away. I... Oh, Davy. Davy, I, I had no idea you felt like that. Oh, if only mud. Your ma promised you to somebody else, did she, Polly? Well, there was some talk of it. But you prefer me, Polly? Oh, yes, David. Oh, oh, oh. Listen, Polly. 
I'll ride by next Thursday and bring a horse and bridle and saddle for you. You be ready to go. We'll be married despite your mom. <laughs> Afternoon, Miss Henley. Afternoon, Mr. Finley. Afternoon, Davy. You, you, you appear to be all in the lather. Is your Polly ready? I come for her. Oh, you have then, have you? Well, you could just hit away again before I clutch your nose. No, no, my... then, dear. Oh, don't don't, don't lose your Polly. Now, wait too. a minute. No. I'll not uh, have my girl marrying any good for nothing, Roland Stone, no matter what you say. Well, we're part, ma'am, but Polly and I talked it over and we agreed. I don't intend even to dismount here. I'm just here to get Polly. Polly, you ready? I'm ready, Davy. Yeah, come on. Simmer down, simmer down now, Mrs. Oh. Finley. Your daughter's not going for her, just to the justice of the peace. Up you go, Polly. Yeah. Good, goodbye, Davy, and then good luck. I'll be back. Well, we ain't heard much legendary yet, Davy. You'd take taller talking than that to get you a place on this cloud. Now, hold on, boy. I am just warming up. Now, in, in fairness to your chances, Davy Crockett, you better tell us some pretty lively things if you want to be a legend. Now, remember, wars against the engines don't count for much. Why, Dan Boone, I was just going to tell you how I met the Creek Indians in 23. Skip it. All right, Dan. I'll just say that after it was all over, we made some peace treaties and settled down for quite a spell. Seemed like we were in for a season of happiness. Always that way, just before something fierce happens to you. Polly. My Polly was took sick and died. I was left with three children, two sons and the youngest a daughter, just a baby. After about a year, I come to the conclusion I'd have to have another wife. There was a widow lady living in the neighborhood. I'd begun to pay my respects to her in earnest. But I was as sly about it as a fox when he's robbing a hen. Morning, Colonel Crockett. Morning, Widow Patton. Buddy couldn't ask for better weather. Well, I reckon not. Well, how's everything coming along? Over your way. Oh, pretty good, all things considered. Mm -hmm. Must be quite a chore, a lone woman like you, raising two children, all by yourself and all. Oh, I manage all right. Not proven too much for you? No. Oh. And you manage to do the farming and all, all by yourself? Yeah. Good little farm, too, don't you think? Yeah, not bad. Heard you had your trouble. Sorry about your wife, Colonel. Yeah. Find yourself lonely, do you? Why, no, not at all. Oh? Well, a little, maybe. I thought maybe. <clears throat> Matter of fact, uh, Mrs. Patton, I was thinking about... Uh, didn't marry it again, maybe. Do tell. Well, say, you must invite me to the doings when as an F. Oh, I meant to. I, I, well, I, what I was thinking of was... Uh, listen, Mrs. Patton. We've always been good friends, ain't we? Uh-huh. Yeah, so I thought. Well, you're a lone widow and me a widower, so... This, I, uh, proposal, Colonel? That's what I had on my mind, yeah. Well, well, seems like a likely idea to me. Good for you, <laughs> ma'am. I'll, I'll, I'll ride for the justice right away. Davy, seem like all you tell us is that you had two wives. You got to do more than that to qualify as a legend. Uh, don't worry, John Henry, I will. Well, to resume, good arrangement that was, turned out. Couldn't have been better for either party. We didn't stay where we was, of course. Too many traders kept moving in and settling where we were. We went to Shoal Creek, about 80 miles west. So many bad characters begun to flock in on us, we had to set up some sort of government. They made me one of the magistrates. 
All went very well till the government made us part of Giles County. Then we had to get more formal. Had to write out our warrants and everything. Now, Davey, now that you've been appointed magistrate by the assembly, there's a law. You got to draw up the warrants in writing. Sign them, you know, to make it proper. Warrants on a piece of paper? Yeah, that's what I was told, Davy. You're supposed to keep a book and write down all the court proceedings in it. But listen, Jim, you, you know I can't write my own name. Yeah, that's why I'm might worried, Davy. Fellas in the assembly might want to see your book. Well, if that ain't a huckleberry over my persimmon. I ain't never had a decision of mine reversed yet. Why should I have to write it down? Yeah, well, that's the law, Davy. Jim, can you write any? I can write some, Davy. Could you write my name, maybe, or teach me the way? Reckon I could teach you? Uh, well, I'll tell you what. If there's any trouble, don't you bother looking me up to sign any war. You just make one out and go ahead and sign it. Then, well, if there's any mistakes, I'd, I could fix them up during the trial. But, Davy, can you read? How'll you know if I make mistakes? Huh? Well, uh, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it, Jim. <laughs> were never appealed from, because I relied on natural-born sense and not on law. Never read a page in the law book in all of my life. Any case from being magistrate, they got to talking about my being in the state legislature. After I'd served a couple of terms there, they began booming me for the Senate of the United States. So you think being in Congress makes you a legend, huh? Huck Finn, you listen to how I got that. You ever hear a voice like this? Sure, it's a guinea hen. Okay. Now, you listen to how them hens got me elected. Yeah? I run against two other fellas. They thought my being a candidate was a mere matter of sport. Didn't think for a moment that they was in any danger from a backwoods bear hunter. Well, I recollect a political meeting. My first, Colonel Alexander. My friends, good neighbors of the fair state of Tennessee, I'll not pause to take up your time for more than a reference to my only true competitor, General Arnold, our state's attorney general. No other man, for all intents and purposes, can consider himself a candidate of any importance. Yeah. Now, uh, now, let us consider the case of General Arnold. Good soldier, better lawyer. But don't the voters of this fair state feel it'd be more advisable to keep him as a lawyer? Thank you. Thank you, my fellow citizens of the great state of Tennessee. And I wish to thank my esteemed rival for Congress, Colonel Alexander. I may say my only rival, for there can be no doubt... In, uh, there can be no doubt in your... <laughs> Yeah, what the deuce is that infernal noise? Sounds like a guinea head, General. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't appear to like your speech, yeah. baby. Yeah. Uh, look here. Drive him away, will you? Excuse me, General. Yes, what is it? Maybe I should introduce myself, since you and Alexander act like you don't know I'm running for Congress against you. <laughs> I'm Davy Crockett, General. And guinea hens love to listen to my speech making. Well. <laughs> I'll say, though, General, you're the first man I ever seen that understood the language of foul. <laughs> when you didn't have the politeness to mention my name in your speech, my little friends, the guinea hens, all started in to call. <laughs> what they're saying is, crock it, crock it, crock it. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, Lamb, I'm like the feller beating on an empty barrel, barrel, barrel of cider. I ain't had none either. <laughs> I had a speech in me a while back, but 
I don't know if it's still there. And anyway, if it is still there, why, well, I don't think I can get it out. <laughs> well, I'm glad the powder horn. Think it's time we all went a whistle a little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Talk it all out. Sort of tactics and a little common sense. Well, I beat my competitors 2,748 votes. Quite a landslide, all the folks said. So I went to Washington. Ever go to Washington City, Huck Finn? Of course not. No legends ever goes to Washington. No, Washington's no place for us. Well, it's a funny place. Folks stared at me like they'd never seen a bearskin cap before in their lives. Boys, I fit the political machine the whole time I was there. But they ganged up on me when I got back home, beat me 232 votes, contrary to all expectations. My wife Sarah met me when I come home that day in late fall. Hat fits you better, Davy? Why? Why wouldn't it? Understand you lost the election. Well, they ganged up on me, Sarah. What I say, if they get satisfaction out of winning with them kind of tactics, why then uh, they're welcome well, to be in Congress. Yeah, you let them know, Daddy. That's yes, sir. Well, I told them, Sarah. I told the senators what I thought of them while I was there, anyway. Uh, Got right up on my feet and yes, lit into them. Yes, I just hear it, just right. to clear. Yes, sir. Mr. Speaker, I says, Mr. Speaker, I yeah. just got a few words Davey. to get off my chest. Davy, Davy. Davy. You ain't in Washington City now, Davy. Only living things around here that has the time to listen to your speech of fine is those chickens over yonder. Chickens? Yeah, those chickens. You want to tell anybody what you told the senators, you mosey on over and just tell them chickens. Don't bother me. And don't frighten the young'uns. <laughs> You don't don't figure that makes you a legend now, do you? No, oh, Daniel Boone. It's what I'm going to tell you now. Because it was at this time I figured I'd cut and quit the states, head down, help the Texans get their independence. Said goodbye to my wife and the children. They'd almost grown big enough to take care of themselves by then. And headed west. Reached San Antonio in December 1835. Went right up to the commander. Oh, yes, sir. What can I do for you? Name's Colonel Crockett, sir. Davy Crockett. Come to offer my service. Davy Crockett. Well, I'm Colonel Jim Bowie. Glad you're with us. We'll need you. Any adventure in the wind? Colonel, we've had news. They're marching on us from Monterey with 5,000 men. We're only 150. But we've a good stout mission for a fort. The Alamo. Count me in, Colonel Bowie. Do whatever I can. Morning of February 23rd, we held a little council of war. The enemy was on the outskirts of the town, so we decided we better hightail back into the fort. Around noon, they marched into the town, the red flag in front, to show they didn't intend to give any quarter. Well, neither did we. That afternoon, a messenger come to parley with Colonel Travis in command of the Alamo. You are in command here? I am. Speak up quick. We don't like your kind around here. My general has instructed me to demand complete and unconditional surrender. And to say that if you refuse, every man will be put to the sword. He demands your immediate answer. Gunner. Yes, sir. Fire your cannon. Yes, sir. Fire your cannon. Fire cannon. That's your answer. Now get and get fast. All right, men. 
It's midnight now, the ninth day we've been holding them off. This Alamo church here is as good a place as any to tell you that in a few days, perhaps within a few hours, we must be in eternity. But I ask you to do all in your power to withstand the assault of the enemy. I ask you to fight for liberty. We shall fight them when they storm the fort. Fight them when they scale those walls out there. Fight them until our arms are powerless to lift our swords in defense of ourselves, our comrades, and our country. Then, I draw this line across the floor with my sword. Those of you who want to escape, better take your chance now. Those who want to remain and fight that fight, step across this line to my side. Out of my way, boys. I'm going over. We're with you, Davy. Come on. Last one across loads the muskets tonight. You're brave men, all of you. Colonel Crockett, I ask you to take charge of these men. Take them back to their posts. The enemy will attack at daylight. Come, let them come. There are only a couple of muskets, Ben. Yes, sir. Hey, Colonel, don't you think they're getting a wee mite too close? Ah, uh, makes easier, eh? Watch. Golly, Colonel, two shots and two dead. Ah, it's just a fire average. But who say it? Tell me, Lee. You see a crowd lining up over there? Ah, it's a band they're bringing up from the left for the victory march, I guess. Victory march? What do you mean? That's boys' field. Why don't these men shoot them off? Colonel Crockett, sir. Well? Colonel Bowie and his men are all dead, sir. You and five of us are all that's still alive in the Alamo. Oh. Ben, load me some guns. Yes, sir. So they're bringing up a band, eh? I think it's all over. What tune do you suppose they'll serenade us with? Well, we can guess, Colonel. Probably to Guilio. Means no mercy. Well, boys, that's just what they'll get from the six of us, eh? No mercy. Might as well give them a little tune myself. Come, tyrants, shake your iron rod, and slavery flank her gall and chains. We fear you not. We trust in God and freedom's right. Colonel Crockett, sir. My, my boys, they got me. And last, that my name on it. Well, boys, that's my story. Plugs bang in the middle of my song. And that was the end of the Alamo. But the beginning of independence in Texas. Well, does that get me place on this cloud? Mm, pretty fair tale, Davy. What do you say, John Henry? Does Davy Crockett get a place on this cloud reserved for us legends? Right smart story. And you excuse me, Colonel Crockett? Speak up, Daniel Boo. Ah, uh, these... These things are always got to be conducted with respect for proprietors. <clears throat> Anybody making a motion relative to Colonel Crockett here? I move he be allowed to become a legend. You're, you're a minor, Huck. You've got no vote. Uh, I'll make the motion, Colonel Boone. Oh, second it, Daniel. Who's that? Paul Butler. Move and second it, Davy Crockett be allowed to become a legend. All in favor? Aye. Opposed, none. Davy... We make you welcome to the cloud reserved for American legends. Davy Crockett. They voted him in, and rightfully he belongs to the immortals. But there's another part of him, something in Davy Crockett's gallant spirit that has never left America. That's why we know he also belongs to us.
John McIntyre and the Cavalcade players, our thanks for their performance of the story of Davy Crockett on the Cavalcade of America. And now DuPont brings you news of chemistry at work in our world. Potters and glassmakers used to hand down their secrets from father to son. It was a spirit that produced beautiful pieces now and then, but it discouraged new ventures and held back general knowledge. And out of many pieces that went into the kiln, only a few came out with real beauty of form and color, because so little was known of the science of heat control, and still less was known of chemistry. Today, exact chemical science gives us beautiful vanadium yellows, uranium oranges, and molybdenum whites that were unknown to potters and glassmakers yesterday. The ceramic color plant of the DuPont Company at Firth Amboy can match thousands of colors. You may have wondered how color is put on a glass water tumbler. Glass colors have two things in them, pigment to give the color and flux to give the finish. The flux is clear glass. It's melted in a high temperature furnace and dropped hissing into cold water where it shatters into the proverbial million pieces. These pieces are dried and put into a mill in which thousands of small porcelain balls tumble around and around. They grind the flux to a fine powder and at the same time pound the pigment color into it. It takes from eight hours to three days to grind it fine enough. What comes out is an enamel, you might say, made with fine ground glass. Suppose a factory wants to make a glass water tumbler with a purple stripe around it. The stripe is painted on by hand or machine, and when the tumbler is fired in a kiln, the stripe actually melts into it and becomes part of it. It's a delicate operation. A few degrees too much heat and the tumbler will melt. Or if the purple stripe contracts more rapidly than the tumbler, it'll tighten like an iron band around an egg and crack it. With the new ceramic colors made by DuPont, beauty is not a matter of price. On the one hand, we have craftsmen of 20, 30, and 40 years' experience turning out the finest American china, as fine as any made in the world. And on the other hand, we turn out pottery under mass production in America so cheaply that you can step into a store near your home and buy a cup and saucer for a dime. Yet both the finest china and the most inexpensive pottery make use of DuPont ceramic colors. There aren't any grade A or grade B colors. They're simply the best ones chemistry knows how to make. Another good thing about scientifically made ceramic colors is that they don't vary. When you bought open stock dinnerware a few years ago, you could never be sure of matching the color when you replaced a broken cup. Nowadays, a red is always the same red. A green is always the same green. Colorful glass, china, and pottery within everyone's reach are something else we owe largely to the chemist, bringing us, in the words of the DuPont Pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. And now the star of next week's program, Carl Swenson of the Cavalcade Players. Most people know Johns Hopkins as the name of a great medical center and university. But very few know about the man who founded it. Behind the life of Johns Hopkins was a deep and secret sorrow, and it made him wise, compassionate, and generous. One of the great humanitarians who served America, medical science, and the world. And we hope that you'll listen to his story on next week's Cavalcade of America. On the Cavalcade of America, your announcer is Clayton Collier, sending best wishes from DuPont. This is the National Broadcasting Company.